I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, the main theme of, uh, for our study this month is justice. And in the introduction in our books, our quarterlies, they asked a rhetorical question, what is justice? And uh, they, in introducing it, they say that justice is kind of strange. It means different things to different people. Uh, for example, if you were a police officer, justice might think one thing. If you're uh, in some other profession or some other thing, your point of view might be uh, different as to what justice is. And if you were ever called into a jury box to serve on the jury, the lawyer for the state and the lawyer for the defense or the plaintiff and the defendant will ask each prospective um, uh, juror whether there's anything that might uh, prejudice them ahead of time, whether they've read anything in the paper, uh, whether it's a wife or husband of a police officer or <laughs> some other profession, it's, uh, it could perhaps color their opinion. And the whole idea is to get a jury that is, is free from prejudice and uh, um, deciding ahead of time before they even hear the evidence, you know, but to decide on the evidence alone. Um, so justice can mean different things to, to different people. But what the lesson focuses on is what insights do we learn from the scriptures about true justice in the eyes of God. And um, our first unit is the first this month is God requires justice. And how do the Hebrew leaders administer justice through God's law? Very important. And the lesson <laughs> is justice and obedience to the law. And it comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And it's Moses' instruction uh, to the people of Israel, to the Hebrew people. And I'm going to read this. Uh, starting with Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 3. 10, 12 through 13, and chapter 27, 1 through 10. Moses convened all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I am addressing to you today. You shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here alive today. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Then Moses and the elders of Israel charged all the people as follows. Keep the entire commandment that I am commanding you today. On the day that you cross over Jordan into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and cover them with plaster. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord the God of your ancestors promised you. So when you have crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones about which I am commanding you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall cover them with plastic, and you shall build an altar there to the Lord your God, an altar of stones of which you have not used an iron tool. You must build the altar of the Lord your God of unhewed stones, then offer up burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Make sacrifices of well-being and eat them there, rejoicing before the Lord your God. You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very clearly. Then Moses and the Levitical priests spoke to all Israel, saying, Keep silent and hear, O Israel. This very day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore, obey the Lord your God, observing his commandments and his statutes that I am commanding you today. Now, what does the word law mean in today's text? Well, there's a word that's called Torah, and that translated would be the law, the first five books of the Bible, the law. But it's also uh, got a second meaning. 
to teach, to, uh, to instruct. And you can tell from the tenure of what Moses had uh, told the people, you know, the tenor of that, it's you do this, I am instructing you, I am teaching you what to do. Now in today's text, uh, Moses is not only stating the law, but instructing the people how to have a good relationship with God, how to get right with God, how to live righteously. Now, what are the terms? Uh, God and the community of faith must belong to one another. In effect, God's people must commit to God completely. They must be thankful out of what God has given them. Of course, the covenant land. Now, most important, his people must recognize and honor the covenant relationship to God. His people must worship him, write God's law on the stone where all could see, must build an altar and sacrifice, and his people must obey the Ten Commandments, of course. And um, now, the interesting thing is, what are the Ten Commandments? And um, so I looked it up. It's in the book of Exodus, and uh, but it's kind of scattered in the book of Exodus. You have the, the commandments, uh, a discussion, but it's it's uh, several different parts of the book separated uh, by different different chapters. But stated briefly in Exodus uh, twenty, these are the requirements: Do not worship any other gods before me. That's twenty point three. Do not make idols of any kind. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not falsely testify. And do not uh, cut it. Now, those are the, the Ten Commandments. Now, I remember uh, Trevor Williams in teaching a lesson one time said something that, that you know, I think is really true. He said, when you study the New Testament, you really need to go back and study the Old Testament as well. And, of course, the reverse of that would be true, that in light of the Old Testament, what does Christ say on how to live, how to be right with God? And, uh, of course, the, com the most complete statement that Christ made was in uh, chapter five of Matthew's the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we had talked about um, how it's so important in Jewish poetry, and I suppose in thought as well, even in character, of parallelism. And in the parallelism, you state one thing, and then the next sentence would be either just restating it in different words, or you might have it entirely opposite. And, uh, the and then you learn from the comparison or the contrast, uh, the parallelism. And I guess the, the clearest example would be in uh, Christ's wonderful uh, prodigal son, a parable of the prodigal son, a parable means placing it side by side. Of course, you got the two brothers. One's the hard working one, stays on the farm, and the other is the problem. He wants, his, he wants it now. He wants to grab the money, the inheritance. He goes to a foreign land and squanders it on prostitutes. And uh, then he comes back when he realizes he has no other place to go. But the interesting thing is, how about the other brother, the one that stayed on the farm? Our sympathies would normally be with him, hardworking, done what he's supposed to. But uh, I think it was Matthew Perry writing over 350 years ago in his commentary said the brother, the other brother, the nice brother, doesn't come off too well in the final analysis. He's got a great deal of pride. I've done this. I've done that. And so in a way, there are some things that are not very admirable about him. And he goes to his father when the father sees the son from far off, kills the fatted calf, right? Puts his own cloak around him and takes him to, from the hall of the celebration and the other brother that's worked so hard said, how come, how come? And so then you have the parable of the father telling the son that he loves him, that the son that was lost is now found. Now the parallel comes in right before the prodigal son. You have, first of all, the parable of the lost coin, 
an inanimate object, the lost lamb, which is uh, an animal, and then finally the lost son. Now, what happens? The father tells him that he loves them both, but uh, we never know whether the other brother, the hardworking brother, forgives and is able to step over the threshold into the hall of celebration. Now, if it's meant metaphorically, then the kingdom of God is the celebration hall, and the Father is God. Uh, I remember Bob Lewis saying one thing in talking about the parable, and he said, uh, it shows us the heart of God. He loves them both. He loves everyone, no matter. And uh, now in Christ's uh, explanation, in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Notice the way he brings out parallelism to be able to make the point. And he, first of all, talks about the attributes of being in the, the kingdom of God. Uh, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Now, in each of the Beatitudes, which in effect, leads off the, uh, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, take the those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God blesses those who seek after justice. And then Christ, the second line, they will receive it in full. They will receive justice in full. And God blesses those who are persecuted because of God. And then Christ, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. But the interesting thing is that in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ then takes each point that Moses brought up in Exodus on the Ten Commandments, states the law, and then expands on it and explains it. And he's saying, this is what you need to get right with God. Uh, not how many stones you pile on a rock, not uh, just... Uh, just the basic thing, do not steal or do not murder, uh, Christ expands it. And let me give you some examples. So let's take the concept of murder. Do not murder is the law. But Christ says that uh, hating someone is about the same as murder, that if you have that in your heart. And uh, he says that our relationship with God is dependent on our relationship with others. See, he takes the law and then expands it. And um, there's also, uh, he does uh, adultery, divorce, uh, taking oaths in regard to retaliation, you know, if the law were an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Christ broadens that to say, uh, to turn the other cheek and do more than what's demanded of you. Remember carrying the pack for the Roman uh, soldier. Uh, the Roman could demand anybody uh, to carry his pack for him a distance of what? One mile? And uh, Christ said, don't just do one mile, do two. <clears throat> In effect, do more than is required. But the one that is perhaps um, of great importance is in regard to love. And this is in uh, chapter 5, 43 through 48. The law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Christ says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, who hate you in effect. And how do you return good, good for evil? Um, so how do we follow Christ's teaching, particularly in loving others, in fulfilling the law, in making our relationship right with God? Uh, I thought of a story that uh, that happened back in the 1960s. Um, Y'all remember those who were brought up in Salisbury, Clint Cheney? Remember, he always had a smile on his face. He he always was happy, and uh, I don't think he ever frowned. But but he had gifts. He was intellectually challenged. Back then they called it retarded, but it it. Clint, somehow, you never thought of that. He was just so happy, a little short guy. And you'd see him walk in the streets. And um, he would he would remember when I was out of town. He'd say, you've been out of town for a month or two, haven't you? Yeah. Something like that. 
And I was down in Clemson and Charles Taylor came up to me and said, I heard what happened about Clint and what had happened. A bunch of guys saw him uh, uh, walking down the street. They pulled up beside him and to talk him into getting the car. I said, come on, we're gonna take you to ride. And so Clint sitting in the front seat and one of the guys in the back seat draws a pistol and shoots him in the back of the head, killing him. They take him out to some country cemetery. They dig some shallow grave, and put him in it, pile some leaves on top of it. I don't remember how they caught him. Could have been somebody saw the license tag. Somebody had a pang of conscience and turned the, the rest of the name. Happened. I know. He his legs off. Oh, God, they did. Yes. Just really mean stuff. And, um, but the interesting thing about this was something that uh, Art Donaldson, uh, the fellow lawyer, told me about uh, later. The Helen Cheney was Clint Cheney's mother. And Clint was the only thing she had with her in Salisbury. There was an older brother, I think, who lived out of state. But Clint was the only thing she had. And uh, to have him taken away in such a cruel way and Art Donaldson said that, uh, that after the guy was convicted, he's already in prison, one who shot her son, that Helen went down to see him. And she prayed with him and then forgave him. I couldn't do what Helen Cheney did. I, it's not in me. I, I would go crazy for something. But Helen did. That was she felt as part of her responsibilities to forgive and to pray for someone and to forgive them. Unbelievable. Uh, so God looks to us not only to obey this law, but to be an example to others, in effect, to teach others. And that's that's part of the Sermon on the Mount. They will know. The, you know, it was a hymn that wasn't in the book I was going to use. It's they, they will know we are Christians by our love, but it wasn't in the book. So I'm going to conclude with three verses from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So I guess the lesson is we all must be the light of the world. We all must love others, be kind to others, do for others, forgive others.